Welcome to another Word in Your Ear, where we're talking about a fascinating and extremely original book, Excavate the Wonderful and Frightening World of the Fall, which is perfectly described in the review I saw as a, a book of revelations. And these are the two people who've compiled it. Welcome aboard, Tessa Norton and Bob Stanley. Lovely to see you. Hi. Good evening. And you have your son, I think, Len, uh, crawling around in his pyjamas at your, at your feet. Yeah. Is that right? Maybe he might make an appearance at some stage. I hope so. You, you might get a cameo from uh, our erratic front man. Uh, excellent, he's the, excellent. He's up in his bedroom at the moment with the, the promise of a bribe. So. Yeah, oh. right. Okay, good. Well, look, I should warn you that Dave and I are, are kind of uh, both entry level fall appreciators. So we need educating, but we absolutely love this book. And it's a really, really unusual uh, format. So, so explain, first of all, the, uh, the component parts of this book. It's really unusual. Um, well, it, it, we got the idea. Um, we were talking about the fall after after Marky Smith, just after, shortly after he died, um, and we've got like a, a shelf of books on the fall, um, and some of them are better than others, but none of them are really what um, the fall meant to us, I suppose. So it's, it's, it was, we were thinking about how would how would you do the ultimate book on the fall. We thought the, the, the way to do it is not to write about the fall at all, but to write about their world or their subject matter, Mark Smith's subject matter. Um, and if it's written by people who are, you know, more than familiar with the fall's work already, then of course the book will be about the fall. Uh, so it's really writing around the subject. Um, and it's a series of essays, isn't it? Uh, some it's, written by you two and some, I presume, commissioned, especially for it by you. And also there's uh, lyrics and, and ephemera and, and including us and then plus a select few reprints which um i think the, the, probably the best known is the mark fisher one memorex for the kraken but which is obviously wonderful um, yeah already um and some others which hadn't had a hugely wide audience maybe they put and published in sort of art press or in academic contexts and um and stuff like that but yeah our idea was that it would be a wide-ranging essay collection that covered a lot of ground and um, yeah, our sort of starting premise was that you can't really look directly at the sun. So, and the fall was like that as well. You know, you needed in order to kind of, you know, interpret or kind of illuminate that world, you would have to kind of talk about like the everything else, you know, everything that was kind of like left. Like, so give us some idea of some of the themes and some of the opinions that the book advances that you thought were particularly good and interesting and, and uh and revealing well we wanted to get a collection of good writers with their own kind of um areas of interest and expertise and to allow them to sort of play to their own strengths so um good example of that the first one in the book is an essay about um about architecture in manchester in the northwest by elaine harwood who's a very eminent architecture writer and um um, writes books, works for Historic England, and she's also just happens to be a massive Fall fan. So she would seem the perfect person to kind of write something that was a sort of synthesis of those. Yeah, those I, think she, I think she's seen the Fall more than anybody I've ever met. I mean, oh, yeah. really? I know she has. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah so it, it, are they the kind, it's quite interesting this. So are they the kind of group that if you, if you find, I say kind of group, they're probably you know, no doubt unique, <laughs> But but if you, if you find fall fans or kind of eminent chemists or I don't know architects or whatever, they can always tell you how the fall illuminates their particular area. Is that is that the kind of thing that tends to happen? I haven't tried it with every single discipline, but I would like to. And <laughs> right. kind of would be good. I bet there's something you could do. Um, yeah, the the interesting thing about fall fans is that found in all walks of life you know fans that we met have quite interesting and varied jobs you know um yeah not always um it's not always obvious there are you know there are also lots of kind of full super fans hiding in public life um who, jeremy, yeah, vine. Yeah, jeremy vine oh really, oh, really? Oh, that's yeah. interesting well yeah. when uh, when Mark died, it was just interesting how many people came out of the woodwork, didn't they, with these uh, major, major intellectuals and Guardian writers and, you know, just all saying, almost competitively actually saying, this group means so much to me. It was, I was really touched by it, actually. Jeremy yeah, Vine, that's fascinating. I think it's, um, yeah, they, I mean, 
yeah, being being in a in a band, uh, it may seem quite odd that the fall of influence and Etienne, but they 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 really have. You know, the, we never did encores when we started. Um, the the sort of typography, um, the press releases, which which I had a few of just by writing to them when I was a teenager. Um, we borrowed a lot from that, and it's so it won't be obvious. And I was I remember like reading um, into the Aztec Camera with with Roger Frame, and he said Aztec Camera, uh, his his, his favourite group is the fall but you'd never know that from listening to them it's um it's i think they they can be that's where they're pretty different to almost any other group i can think of where they could be a major influence without their music really impacting on your music at all it's um well not obviously well that's a really good so, uh, point because it's about it's about kind of a uh, theory and attitude isn't it and technique and application and just the way they made their art as you say you don't have to sound like them at all but it's the, it's the way they operate it was very influential wasn't yeah, it? yeah. and also like a way of looking at the world as mm. well like you know such kind of wide-ranging reference points you know um you still kind of like as you know you go through life you can be doing something quite random you know watching an old film or driving through a town or you know you just see a bit of signage or hear a bit of dialogue or read something in a book and it will just kind of spark like what's like quite a buried full reference that probably seeped in there when you were 14 listening to John P in your bedroom so there's this kind of whole worldview that's kind of buried right in there in like fans heads and that's kind of what we wanted to try to do so it's was not it's not like in any standard kind of music book it's not it's not the band's career it's not track by track it's not this is the best lp or anything like that it's more how they looked looking through their eyes i suppose or marky e. smith's eyes at the things that interested him is that fair enough yeah i yeah, yeah i think, I mean, we, I think it's, we, it's more than yeah we, we said that we, yeah, we, we, we wrote an introduction which it's kind of written for him because it's um uh a lot of subject matter that would have been, that would have interested him. I mean, he might have just thrown it in the bin. Yeah, but, I was going to uh, say, almost certainly. <laughs> <laughs> and they got it out again after you're gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's uh, one chapter I thought was very really actually the one that that you written, Bob, about about the um, about the way they operated again. It's about about amateurism. And it makes such a good point that you know amateurism was a glorious thing. You know, amatory. You know, people did things for love and not for money. And now it's become a, a term of kind of abuse, implying splat, slapdash and, and, and inept. And I thought that was a really interesting point that they were never professionals. You know, that they never signed to a big label. They were never on that kind of uh, album tour cycle that could go off and you could make, you know, could collaborate with, with the dancer Michael Clark. And it gave them incredible freedom. But now that's, there isn't any of that around as far as I can see. You know, that's, that's not a kind of modern value. It's all very commercial. Would that be right? Um, I'm sure there are people who still have that ethic. I mean, again, that's something we, 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 we definitely borrowed from them, um, which is why we never did a yeah. six more of America's to try and break America. It wasn't really very us. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's true. But I think the other, the, the other side of the coin is that he had a really strong work ethic, obviously, or the group. Yeah, had yeah, yeah. Incredibly. So it's like a, you know, non-professional, but with a strong work ethic. Um, so very productive, um, did a, almost an album a year, not quite sort of tailed yeah. off towards the end. Um, but absolutely, it, it gave them complete freedom to do what they wanted. Um, and it's, you know, they, they, they did sign to a major for a while to see what happened. And I don't think they got on top of the pops, but, you know, they got in the top 40. Uh, they got into the smash hit sticker book. They oh, did. Well, there you go. They did, I know. So, yeah, do you think he while. achieved <laughs> what he wanted? I mean, did he, was he resentful about the fact that they hadn't sold more? Or did he achieve what he wanted to achieve, do you think? Um, I, I, I certainly don't think he was greedy. I don't think he ever had no. any any money. I think all the money he ever made went into the group and keeping the group going. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, who knows? As, as far as far as I know, he was he was um, quite happy keeping the group going, and that's that's what he wanted to do. So, yeah, there's a lovely point that you made about the fact that they refused to play TV shows. Uh, where who made them write down their lyrics because obviously TV programs need the lyrics written down for camera angles for the director, you know. And he said that as, as long as they weren't set in stone, the songs were still alive. So, is that how he regarded it? It's been like Bob Dylan records and clearly feels that the way that song was on the day it was taped is just one version of a song that's eternally evolving. Was that how he regarded his songs, do you think? 
I guess so. I mean, again, I, I wouldn't want to second guess what he thought, but it was, they, they would like drop songs for years and then bring them back. Uh, yeah. And, you know, in, in, in quite a different form. Um, and certainly, yeah, they're exchanged. There's, um, there's some uh, really good, very thorough websites about full lyrics and different and, and gigs where they do different versions and he changed the words. And it's all very well annotated online. Um, but yeah, again, that's something else we borrowed from them. We never, Snessie never, never printed lyrics for the, for the same reason, really. It's like, I always think it's better if you hear it, hear a lyric in your head, it's always almost always going to be better than the actual lyric if you've got it wrong. Yeah. I'm trying to think now. Uh, uh, well, actually, the first, no, the first time I heard um, Spectre versus Rex by the Fall, I thought it was about Elmore James rather than Mr. James. I had no idea that <laughs> Mr. James. Right. Was. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> fair point. Fair point. Yeah, it is. It's. Um, I tell you, one of the things that strikes me going through it is obviously, you know, it's got a kind of scrapbooky quality to it, hasn't it? Uh, you know, you've got a a huge amount of printed paper material in here, and. It really brought home to me again just how important ink and paper was to what all sorts of groups did in that era. And when somebody sets out to write anything comparable about bands right now, there won't be that, will there? You know, so yeah. you kept all these scraps or you found all these scraps. Tell us about that and how this stuff came together and how important it is. Well, we wanted very much the visual materials to be, yeah, like you say, the, the paper and the, you know, the nature of each thing that is photographed or scanned in there as an object. So you can see crumples and bits of foxing and stuff like that, because we wanted everything that we put in there to be something that people had treasured. So, you know, it's not a photograph of a mint condition no. album, because that would just look like, you know, it looked when it came out of the factory. Yeah. We wanted the stuff that kind of people had had, you know, pinned to their bedroom wall or that they'd kind of come with them in a shoebox through various house moves and stuff like that. And we wanted to be quite um, true to kind of like what the fans had valued. So there's you know, one of my favourite things in there is a beer mat um, that's been sort of scribbled on and someone's kind of like taken that home. Like, yes, as you would. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I had to carry a bag of Marquis e. Smith's when I was a teenager that was just like the most boring plain white carrier bag that he'd had shoved in his pocket at a gig and you know I mostly pick it up at the end. So you got you go sorry, <laughs> it is a gig. You went to a gig where, when you were a teenager. And, yeah, and you, yeah, you were, tell us about that. Go on. Well and I um, and he'd had this like plain white carrier bag which I can describe you know the kind of one that's got the kind of dome top with the circular handle that you get from. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. yeah. Off license carry. Yeah, yeah off license carry bag. Um, and that just it fell onto the floor at the end of the gig when I picked it up. So I kept this like with the original crumple. Flame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like pinned to my notice board for ages. And then one day it must have just fallen off, and I just put stuff in it, and I forgot. And then like the oh, oh god, I had it for about three years. <laughs> but anyway, that kind of level of object may be a bit more interesting than that. <laughs> There's a wonderful thing printed in called the Sinister Times, which is a kind of mock 1950s newspaper, and it came out, I think, in 1987. Or so. It's effectively just the lyrics that are just beautifully reproduced. I thought that was so fantastic, the amount of effort. There's press releases in there, which I can only assume were written by him. Were they written by him? Because there's, it's yeah. so much kind of fall folklore. And it's all about each member of the new member of the band and what they're like. And uh, just uh, it's so characterful. It, it made me think of um, groups like the Smiths and the Beatles, where, where absolutely everything they did that became public was clearly thought about as part yeah. of some huge artistic statement, really. Everything was yeah. really scrutinised. Yeah, Very no, impressive. Spot on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's, um, yeah, they're, 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 they're the people I look up to the most, I suppose, really, people who've made that much... Uh, Spend that much uh, attention on um, artwork and sleeve notes and uh, whatever. How the spine looks compared to the other records. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, one, one of the things I think hopefully comes across in the book is his sense of humour, because it's it, it's easy for him to be characterised as this curmudgeonly bloke, beer and fags character. Um, and he was, you know, he was. He, there was a lot of warmth to to his um, to the letters he wrote to people, which are in the book. And uh, yeah, they're beautiful. Christmas they're really cards, must have been huge because lots of people we got in touch with had uh, a collection of Christmas cards from him. 
which, and really uh, courteous. Which are all, which are really, oh, really? Not so very funny. Mm. Oh, right, right. Yeah, so not, not kind of uh, barbed and sarcastic then, but... No, no, just maybe like some gentle ribbing or something, pointing yeah. to an elf and going, like, that's you, you know, that kind of thing. But <coughs> yeah, no, just really like old school politeness and warmth. And I think we, we did feel that his reputation was being done a disservice by just reducing it to this sort of caricature of like you know, irascible front man, national treasure, reading the football results. It's obviously part of it. And, you know, there's a, there's a degree to which, um, you know, he probably enjoyed slipping into a persona, you know, to, I think I used the Columbo analogy the other day, which I'm not completely. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Serge Gainsbourg, I think, as well, is yeah. like, you know, the, the, creating a character and then becoming the character. Right. I'm right. sure that's true, actually. Mike, Mike, and I, Mike and I were just talking about this morning, and I said, well, I met him once, and he called me whistle test all the way through the conversation. <laughs> and Mark said, that's funny. I met him once, and he also called me whistle test. He called me whistle test, but first of all, he called me, uh, he called me Yorkshire weatherman. <laughs> and I don't know who he thought I was, but he'd obviously seen me on the television and he couldn't think where it was on the television. Yorkshire weatherman. Right, right, Yorkshire weatherman. <laughs> you know, it was so funny. It was Select Magazine had this event. It was about 1991. It was one of those kind of round table things. Very, very fashionable at the time. Andrew Harrison was, uh, was, uh, was chairing this event. And it was Mark E. Smith. It was Peter Hooten of The Farm and Mickey Berenier, I think it was, of Lush. And they were addressing the great issues of the day and putting the world to rights. Here. And all I can remember about Mark was that he smoked non-stop. He was there for about, I think, four and a half hours. And in those four and a half hours, I think he, he drank 11 pints and 11 uh, whiskey chasers and didn't appear to be remotely pissed. He appeared to be very kind of focused and incredibly funny and scathing. And I thought, this is astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but you're right. He, he there was a kind of curmudgeon uh, kind of persona built up by the press that he was clearly occupying. I think there must have been other dimensions to his character that you never got to see. Yeah, especially yeah. kind of like from the sort of like mid late nineties onwards. But you know, there's there, there's just there's a lot else to it as well. Like obviously, it's you know, it's all the things people say, but it's you know, we also it's why we wanted the subject matter to be kind of as wide ranging in the essays. Yeah. It, it, like, yeah. It's about you know football and factory foremen and ghost stories and you know and Manchester itself and it's not any one thing but it's everything. It's so a, the, it, it's, it's, a, it's a long time since I read a book that had quite so much about working men's clubs in it. Yeah. <laughs> Where, yeah. Go on, d tell us about that. Why was that an important thing? Um, <clears throat> well, I think that was um, probably connected to his work ethic thing. They'd, again, if you read, read interviews with him it sounds like they play working men's clubs all the time and i think uh, paul wilson who's a, a lecturer at leeds uh, has written an, uh, an essay in there on uh, typography um and he um he went through all every gig they ever did and found out how many social clubs or working men's clubs they played and i think it was about eight in total <laughs> well, <laughs> but he certainly built that up didn't he because he talked about that as being where he learned his craft didn't he yeah, and no, people would be throwing real real glasses at him and all yeah. of spitting at him and stuff yeah yeah but bands like, today don't know they're born it's all that isn't it yeah yeah but i love that you know so it's like you know that's as much as uh sort of building up your own mythology as you know elvis did or whatever it's like it's a, it's, yeah. it's a very pop move mm, uh yeah. he, knew, he knew exactly what he was doing um uh, like, well, well, actually, one of my favourite stories in there is uh, where they, they, they left Rough Trade in 81, I think, after Slates, and signed to a label called Camera with a K, which I'd never heard of. I don't think anybody else had ever heard of at the time. It seemed like quite a strange move, but they, they put out Hex Induction Hour. Um, and he's, uh, he's interviewed by, by the quietus in there, and he's saying, uh, yeah, we started the Camera because they're a heavy metal label. I really wanted to get that, you know, that kind of heavy metal vinyl you get. It's really sort of grainy quality. The kind of thing they press Sabbath's greatest hits on, you know what I mean? And the poor interview is going, Yeah, yeah, it's like, no. <laughs> yes, what, what is that? That doesn't exist. Yes, <laughs> like, you read it back and you're like, Hang on a minute, that's yeah, not... yeah, you've done that to everybody, you yeah. know. It's um, it's very... but it's kind of a strangely romantic view of the world, isn't it? Yeah, I'd like it to be like this, you know, I'd like to make a oh, yeah. something that felt like my idea of a heavy metal record. Even it's if my idea is wrong, even if it's not literally true, yeah, isn't it? you know that's course, and yeah. that's kind of, you know there's a sort of it's a fidelity to to something, if, even if yeah. it's not. 
Tell me about tell me about the world of fall fans, because I would imagine if you can write a book as dense and as this, you know, about a subject like the fall, you're not the only ones out there. You, I mean, presumably there are people who are world experts on the fall. Who you, I mean, do you fear those kind of people going? I think you'll find you've got so and so yeah. wrong on oh, yeah. page oh, thirty two. I yeah. mean, have you dealt with any of that or? There's I mean, there's, I think we wanted to take a different approach, partly because the yeah. um, there's some really brilliant websites created by the fans, which are like so thorough and collect like, set lists and dates that things happened and really like map that process by which, you know, sets evolve and songs change and lineups change and stuff like that. And, you know, all that stuff's out there. And we just we didn't want to kind of like to rep reprint or like repeat. No, well, I've got a, a, a timeline yeah. in to give it, to yeah. give it a thread. But, um, but, but also, I mean, a lot of those people we did obviously get in touch with uh, because they've got mm -hmm. a lot of the material in the book was, was borrowed from them. Right. And they, they, they were all, absolutely all of them were lovely. They're really nice. Uh, nobody was, oh, hold on a minute. I was going to do a book like that. No, no one said anything. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was really interested in reading. There's a lot about football in the book. And it... it it made me feel that, in a sense, they, they, I don't know if they're as much as fans as supporters. The, the football analogy seemed really appropriate to me. It's a bit like Happy Mondays. You know, the people who went to see them were going to see them as if going to an away fixture. And the fall could clearly play the same set uh, two consecutive nights. And maybe one of those nights, they'd be absolutely brilliant. And one, they'd be terrible. So there was a kind of result at the end of the evening. Do you know what I mean? There was a scoreline. And, oh. and they, people seemed to sort of feel that they were part of the rhythm of life somehow seeing the group did you think that's true that there was there were they, 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 that kind of loyalty of the fans was like a kind of we support them for better or worse you know yeah no i think that's that's, that's, that's a really good analogy um and you know you're absolutely right about whether how good they might have been on certain nights i think adele stripe who wrote um one of the essays says she saw them um and it was the worst gig she'd ever seen in her life and then she didn't go and see him for about another 15 years because she was really scared to go and see them again um, but it, in, the, the in the years in between, the best or you yeah, know, in the like, years yeah. in between, she 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 just found them fascinating and got into them anyway. But uh, that's mm. a pretty amazing starting point. The worst gig you've ever yeah. seen. It really I is. So why? But, yeah. It but is. That's, that's generally, are really they like quite. Um, they're not uncritical. You know, there's right. um, there's there's a sort of um, the way I I see it, and I I wouldn't want to kind of uh, presume how everyone else feels, but. It's like there's once you're invested in it, you know, you have to kind of care when it's bad if it matters to you about when it's good. So that's a really like important thing. But also, maybe this feels a little bit contradictory, but hopefully not. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how you had whether you had a good time at any particular gig because the whole project and the way it kind of yeah, evolved yeah. Yeah. itself is is sort of the point um but yeah the, the fans are great we met some really lovely people and um obviously they've kept brilliant things and we're quite on board with kind of what we thought was interesting as well um, and he seems very like football manager to the way that, that there's i can't remember how many members of the fall have been there's over 60 now is it he's constantly changing the lineups and so you look back at periods of the fall like you look back at at uh, moments in a history uh, in a in a football club's uh history with a particular lineup, don't you? And he was always scouring the lower league groups, was he, for new members? And I think that's just a, just an interesting, totally different way of doing things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, a lot of, uh, lot of new members just came from other, other bands in, not just in Manchester, but in like, sort of the Prestwich area. I was going to say, because he, he yeah. combed the local area. Yeah. So he must have been, if you were a musician in that area, you must have one time or another had the rule run over you by Marky e. Smith. Yeah. And either join the group or, sorry, not, you're not right. Oh, seriously, mustn't that have happened? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I'd have thought so. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And you do wonder how many undocumented members there are out there. <laughs> Absolutely. People who don't talk about it. They did one gig. Because well. <laughs> <laughs> Was Mark Riley really sacked on his wedding day? Oh, well, that's yeah, wedding, that, yeah. That's one. That's one claim that um, <laughs> I've I've lost track of who said what, but I will tell you this: that not all the stories add up. And what what might seem quite strange 
about the book, but we definitely felt was the fairest way is that we didn't significantly involve any or didn't really involve any ex members because we just felt it was what we wanted to do was kind of uh, capture kind of what they meant to the fans. And there are so many stories to tell. There are so many ex members. They all deserve their own. Space. Well, absolutely. Well, surely I once you've asked one, you've right, got to ask the other. Right. 59 or whatever you, you, you did the right thing you did yeah, the right you know, thing. Completely different kind of book and it wouldn't be anywhere yeah. nowhere near as uplifting and uh energizing as the book you put out there's only so many pages that you can like cram yeah. into the yeah. 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 so what bit what bit of the book are, are you are you personally most you know pleased with proud of would like to draw people's attention to think it turned out well whatever Anything um, in particular? Oh, that's another oh, thing. Oh, lots. Um, well, a lot of the, well, a lot of the, the, the his, his things he's written. The early written. press releases and stuff, I think, yeah. are amazing. Right, they're right. wonderful. Well, wonderful. You know, we put, you know we've, we've tried to kind of reproduce them as kind of close to original size as possible. The book's obviously a bit smaller than A4, but they're worth kind of pouring over and like like really like immersing yourself in, in that voice. That stuff's just priceless and um some of the yeah. lyrics uh well i mean well, the notes for lyrics notes they're probably for lyrics. not yeah. final or anything like that but um ian, ian penman um interviewed him in i think 79 and and mark smith gave him just some type type written lyrics uh which yeah weren't, weren't the ones that came out mm. um it's like a early version of psychic dance hall um and he kept them all this mm. time and uh lent them to us which is was fantastic uh, but i think he typed out the lyrics uh for um the other band members so we got some others via yvonne paulett who was uh in the group for about a year when she was 16 in 78 79. a friend of mine was working in a record shop and her daughter um came in to do record like work experience so um so he'd had like some copies of like duplicated well she was she, she came she came to work one day that's a good story that's a... well yeah okay she's um yeah, no, the, uh, so this girl came, kind of came in and my friend had like a full badge on and this girl just went, my mum was in them. And she's like, what, 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 what? My mum was in them. And then they got talking. That's a good them. line, that is my mum. Yeah. <laughs> I know. But it's like, you know, it's also it's such a nice kind of like passing of generations thing. Like, you know, I guess statistically there's quite a lot of kids. Walking my around. mum was in the fall. That's, a good... <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Just going back to the lyrics, I was just, you know, all those songs about those characters, Joe Total and Wireless Enthusiast and Fiery Jack and the man whose head expanded. And then there's, so he invents all those characters. Then there's songs about his own life, you know, working in the docks at one point. Um, there's songs about, um, you know, observations, uh, killer conspiracy, about posh people liking football. There's one amazing song about a, uh, rebellious jukebox it's written from the point of view of the jukebox itself really and it made me think uh, what, are there any other lyricists who write in such a wide variety of idioms I, I couldn't really think of anybody can you think of anyone who you could compare with him in principle there's no i mean we've been, been asked if there's an, uh, if there's anybody else who could do a book like this about and i think i mean i was thinking bob dylan was like one of the few people i could think mm -hmm. of yeah <clears throat> or uh and similarly kind yeah. of that kind of push pull of him being like resistant to you know interpretation yeah. or using bits of misdirection obviously a very different artist but you know i don't think it's a stretch to say it's kind of comparable yeah. in scope um but you know i would i can imagine i could imagine good books of this nature on anyone who's where the the kind of the meaning of their work is a little bit detached from the public understanding of the yeah suppose. um but only the fool would have the book with all this stuff in because you know it, no I, the, the only other uh, the only yeah. other group i was thinking about uh, and clearly you wouldn't have anything about football or northern working men's clubs in it is the grateful dead who mm. kind of you either you either buy the whole idea of the grateful dead Oh, yeah. you don't buy it at all. You don't. Yeah. You don't get on board for one little bit of it. You know, what I mean? mm -hmm. and, and uh, people are going to the Grateful Dead. Well, uh, back in the day, they said some gigs were terrible, some gigs were brilliant. Didn't yeah. make any difference. It was an unfolding story, wasn't it? It was just. 
It was a yeah. thing that was going on all the time. But, but that leads me to the question, do they have fans in America? And how do they respond to the very specific northern Manchester, you know, lens on everything? They do, but all the ones I know are quite Anglophile. So oh, really? Understand it. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, I guess there's yeah. there's levels of n nuance that. Well, Bruce, I mean, Bruce yeah, is a fan yeah, of yeah, of course. And and there's an essay in the book that Dan Fox wrote about. Um, he's an English guy now lives in New York, so it's been an interesting sort of take on it. Is about the fall and their relationship to America and like how that's you know he like maybe kind of surprisingly pro-American um, and kind of enjoyed going over there and obviously, you know, married an American wife and that was something that, that interested him at least for a time. Um, but yeah, you're right. It is it is very specifically Northern. Your little boy just Len, appeared back. Len just appeared. Did you see him there? <laughs> so the head appeared between the two of you. That is wonderful. He just had a look. He, he wants his bribe. You 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 know you brought a point to make probably. <laughs> He's thinking I've heard all this before. My parents are <laughs> quacking on about the fall again. <laughs> yeah, maybe just got a notch smaller. Oh, I just wanted to mention uh, the extraordinary details. There's, there's lots of really interesting stuff about where the the musical influences come from, which uh, you know, Beef Art and Zappa and Peter Hamill and the Seeds and the Stooges. And at one point, you, you I don't remember which chapters in there. They, 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 it mentioned Kenny Everett's world's worst record show which is an album that came out in about 78 i think it consisted of just absolutely frightful amateurish kind of hopeless they're attempts bad, at comedy bad, but, record, not so fast no but, no, but, no, but they, of course they were really a lot of them were really really influential weren't they yeah i mean yeah. it's uh yeah it's, it's it's a mixture of stuff that is genuinely appalling like uh, yeah. Jessica records and yeah. uh the, the legendary Stardust Cowboy, who, as it turns out, apparently influenced Ziggy Stardust and Marky e. Smith. So. Right, right, right. That's sure. right. That's He's right. That. And um, I'm going to Spain by Steve Bent, which is uh, which he did a version of, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, which yeah, is, yeah. A, a terrific, a terrific record. It's like both enough. versions. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. doesn't yeah. like anything ever written. Wasn't there a, a rumor or a theory once that the whole thing was an elaborate? Prank by Kenny Everett and Steve Bent didn't really exist, which yeah. didn't turn yes, out. Yes, there was. True. That's true. Bent is real, but I also like that kind of parallel theory that it's some sort of psyop, and this none of this stuff is really real. <laughs> but you, but you actually, I, I, I don't know if you say this or somebody says this in, in the book that the world's worst record show, uh, show whatever it was called, was the most influential record right. in, in, in the fall the universe fall's history. Yeah. <laughs> Which I really like. That I idea. like that too. <laughs> but it's not it's... Moon, is it? You know, I really like no, that. no. But I suppose it's like you know, they, they obviously the amateurism of, of most of the people on there is uh, probably quite uh, quite an influence. Sorry, the production values of um, Nervous Norvus. I mean, you, you probably know Transfusion by yeah, now. Yeah, Transfusion. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, at all. Well, yeah, which is a Waters film, I think. So I mean, it's um, yeah, it's kind of uh, I mean, yeah, there are there are there's uh, I can't think what else. Shifting Whispering Sands by Eamon Andrews. Oh, and Eamon Andrews. Yeah, yeah. Not a big influence on the fall, but it's, it's not the whole <laughs> album, but uh, certainly bits of it. And I think just the the, the idea of it, this um, very strange kind of like other music, which it's is, kind you know, of well, it's it's kind of outsider music, as it, as it fashionably became yeah. called yeah, later yeah. on. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that yeah, that's what Bob Trimble would have ended up on there. If um, and also really crude and kind of one chord, a lot of it wasn't it? You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's also, isn't it also, and I speak as a complete outsider on this, isn't it also exemplifies something that ran through the fall, which was this kind of anti cool, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. It was, it was kind of clanky and awkward and, you know, and celebrated those things. I mean, yeah. did yeah, the fall ever care what they looked like? I think well, he, I think he did. I, yeah, um, but it, but it, it, you know, it was never, it was never too fashionable. You know, like we were saying earlier, it never got cozy, but never too fashionable. But you know, at the same time, it always has, you know, an aesthetic. And, yes. You know, no, I agree with that. The way he would, like Mark, would dress on stage was, you know, just quite like a normal guy. You know, it's just like it's it. So it's almost, 
it's slightly disarming, I suppose. You know, no one's sort of like playing at being a punk or whatever. No. You dress like kind of, you know, almost to, to blend in, and then the content of your uh, um, your work is what's what's surprising and why. Has anything uh, since you finished the book? And a book like this must take a hell of a lot of pulling together because you've <coughs> got the art as well as the the words. Presumably, Sod's Law dictates that as soon as you've finished it and send it off to the printer, you've found something that somebody sent you something that, damn, you should have got that in. Has that not happened? We, we, I mean, we had more stuff than we could use already. All right, okay. And also, I don't, I don't want to moan about lockdown too much, but obviously, we were preparing it last year, and if it, if it hadn't been for that, you know, who knows what more stuff we could. Um, we could have found mm. but um but you know we had uh, we had access to some like amazing collections already mm. and I, I was sort of really happy with everything that we got and that you know there were other things that you know if we'd be able to travel a little bit and you know talk to maybe more of the artists or something i can yeah. also imagine it would have been really nice to make space for you know some of the artists that were involved in the sleeve artwork and some of the exhibitions but as it was we just didn't have space to to do that justice but yeah. i that's the only thing i think you know, we, we would have liked to include that we didn't mm. really because um the artists are in germany or america yeah. or cornwall yeah. all of which yeah. were equally inaccessible last yeah year. <laughs> as much so. but as, <laughs> as 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 full admirers tend to be kind of completist then uh, the possibility of a second volume yeah, is, I'll get is surely saying, not out of the really. question really is it yeah uh, we, well yeah I mean, yeah, someone was saying we should do it like a Bino annual. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that's a damn, that's a good idea. And, you know, I can think, I can also imagine, you know, another 10 essay commission that would be equally good. I quite like your chemistry idea. I want to hear. Oh, there you go. Well, a, yeah. I'll find you a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, there it is. Excavate the wonderful and frightening world of the fall. Available and bookshops actually reopen next week. So you can actually go and support your local independent bookstore by buying this book. Uh, um, it, it's out. It's out now. <laughs> Tessa and Bob, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And uh, really good to see you. Thoroughly <laughs> recommended that. Book. And now, now you're gonna now you're gonna go and bribe your boy. You, you <laughs> you've you've told him if he's quiet, he'll get some bribe. I can't imagine what it is. Uh, I think, but, yeah, uh, giving my debit card and the Lego website. I don't know. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, the well, shape, the shape of modern parenting. <laughs> Very nice to talk to you. Great to see you. Cheers. Fantastic. Cheers.